He got the necklace earlier. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. I'm now going to turn back to social science as opposed to art. <laughs> Though I could spend, you know, my five minutes talking about Australian Aboriginal art and our collecting experiences. So I am very humbled to be elected to this August Academy, which labors so hard to marry the insights and findings of social science with public policy, as we heard Alan doing today, a goal I support wholeheartedly. I'm even more humbled to be named the Robert Dahl Fellow. A working class boy from Alaska, Dahl spent his high school summers as longshoreman. How many of you knew that? Anybody? Um, a union that informed his thinking and mine, particularly after I became the Harry Bridges Chair in Labor Studies at the University of Washington, where it turns out Bob Dahl was um, an undergrad. Dahl was the first to recognize the name of this legendary leader of the longshore workers and the honor the name entailed. Ken Arrow, another great scholar whose identity was forged in social democracy, was the second. Dahl means many things to me. I fought what I found to be his narrow and at times tone-deaf view of pluralist democracy, forged and published before the civil rights movement made him reconsider some of its implications. But I came to appreciate the commitments that informed his earlier views and allowed them to grow in response to the changing times as well as in response to his academic challengers. I thought Michael Lipsky was going to be here tonight, who was one of them. He was an early fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, CASBIS, which I now direct. It was there, partially as a result of his interactions with Arrow, that he attempted to marry economic and political reasoning, a path I still follow. He returned some years later as part of a successful effort to create a real comparative politics that went beyond the mere collection of single case studies. Dahl's emphasis on comparative democracies informs the agenda that we at CASBIS are now developing with the help of partners such as the Social Science Research Council and a host of others including, I hope, this very academy. Democracy throughout the world is under threat, you might have noticed, as is capitalism, globalism, and government itself. The US of Trump and the Britain of Brexit exemplify national states that have penetrated deeply into their populations and by objective standards act within and are accountable to long established democratic and bureaucratic procedures in the delivery of goods and services yet questions are arising about their legitimacy. Trump is legally the president, so far, <laughs> but he came to office despite losing the popular vote and under the shadow of possible Russian meddling. Moreover, some of his executive orders and actions are legally suspect. Brexit was a legal vote, but there are issues about whether this was the appropriate way to reach such a complex decision and whether the consequences of the decision will undermine British capacity to govern effectively. Democratic institutions first developed in the late 18th century, tweaked over time, and rethought a bit in the Great Depression, appear to be fraying in their capacity to cope with the complex problems, changing economies, and popular dissatisfaction we are experiencing today. It is time to think about how to rebuild our institutions, both political and economic. This compels us to investigate and quickly the sources of and correctives to the fragility of our co contemporary democracies. But there is an even larger and arguably long, longer term problem we confront. The fraying of the moral economies and the political economic models on which these are based. Moral economies, the reciprocal obligations among citizens, governments, corporations, and other stakeholders, guide the policies and practices of government. Without a moral economy, we are adrift in a world lacking bases for social cohesion and shared values. Moral economies change over time, and we are at one of those times. John Man Maynard Keynes heralded the end of laissez-faire and suggested an alternative. The neoclassical 
political economy of Milton Friedman, among others, heralded a new basis for government action, one adopted by Thatcher, Reagan, and many of their successors. Our modest aim at CASBIS is to continue to design the to, is to contribute to the design of an appropriate moral economy for the new world. We like this term because of its historical origin and because it emphasizes that economies are moral and political choices. The Industrial Revolution undid the obligations between agricultural landowners and those who worked the land. Free markets brutally drove workers' lives for a century until in the mid-20th century, the U.S. and other industrial countries set up an interconnected framework of labor rights and citizen benefits and social insurance to ensure that rising productivity was more equitably shared. This shift was not just about changing laws, but about changing expectations about what capitalism ought to be and what it could become. In response, these countries enjoyed the greatest growth in human history. Today, that framework is fraying as gig labor business models evade the employer-employee relationship assumed in our laws and our manufacturing sectors are automated. Fashioning a new moral economy will require shifting popular ideas about co corporations, work, politics, citizenship, and of course, government. We still have choices about the future of our societies. And these are choices social science can and must help formulate and advocate and research. Thank you.